Hello again. I'm Mark Pennell along with Paul Sartorelli, and we're on the fourth in a series of, um, what do you call them? Uh, the purposes? No, no, that's not right. Um, a series Disciplines. Of... Okay, that's good. I did sort of that on, on the condition of your soul. Before we even get into it, soul, what do you mean? Um, Beatles, Rubber Soul. That's a great Jews, album. Soul, uh, soul James music. James Brown. Absolutely, totally. He was awesome. Yeah, he really was. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway. Okay. What else do we mean by soul? Well, it's something, I, I almost think it is something physical inside us mm. that is definitely, it, it, it moves us forward. Even those who do not know their Lord. Yes, there's a big hole in the soul, but they're trying to do mm -hmm. something that is right. They're trying to be good people. And the soul is trying, some people call it the conscience, I think. Yeah. So in some ways, yeah, it's all of that. It's sort of the immaterial part of us. If this is my material part, it's the immaterial. Right. So in some ways we use it synonymous with the, with the word spirit. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and if you think about it, the material parts of us, there's the conscience that's part of it. It's our will, mm -hmm. um, it's spirit and soul. So it's all of that. And I guess when we re refer to the soul, we do think about that, that key element, you, it's you, but it's also the you that is naked before the Lord. If you allow that, it's you, that is the real you, um, before God. Um, that's the soul. It's the soul that can get starved if you don't pay attention to it. It's the soul that can flourish if you have a wonderful a worship experience. Or I just talked to somebody that, that just got back from the Grand Canyon, mm. and they said, it was amazing for my soul. Mm. Uh, I, I don't understand it because I've never been to the Grand Canyon, but I guess I understand it. So that's what we mean by the soul. It's you. But it's not you that's getting older and, you know, your waistline went from 32 to 34. It, it, it is you that, but it's the, it's the immaterial part of you. It's the, it's something deep inside of you that inter it relates with you and me, but it relates with our father as well. How is your soul? That's what we mean. Think about that question. How is your soul? And uh, the first of our <clears throat> four series was, uh, it was kind of an introduction to solitude. And then we, the second show was totally focused on so, solitude. Then we went to, um, to fellowship. Right. Very important fellowship. And the now, re can I just say that? And the reason yeah. we did it, just to, to take you back in Luke chapter six, Jesus's person, soul, but his whole person was being harassed. And so he leaves the harassing of the, of the others and he goes into solitude, Luke chapter six, and he spends an entire night alone with his Lord, mm -hmm. solitude. Then he immediately picks the 12 disciples, fellowship. And then he takes the 12 and he goes to basically a needy group of people that were needing healed and all kinds of things. And they were touching him in a really beautiful way. And that's what we're calling service. service. Um, when I say Mother Teresa, what do you think? Boy, uh, uh, an amazing lady. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I some people don't like my theology when I say it in in our lifetime. And a little bit earlier. So 20, mid 20th century on, I think three significant world changers take total theology out of the way and politics, three world changers. Okay. Gandhi, mm -hmm. Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. and Mother Teresa. Those are my world changers in the 20th century. And Mother Teresa in the, among the poor of Calcutta, um, Changed the world. That her whole entire life was service. Mm -hmm. There was not a moment I think that she wasn't thinking about what she can do to help other people. Yes, it's and all of us kind of look at her with envy. Even people who don't know her, don't know Jesus. There's a sense of wow, mm -hmm. what did this woman do? One of my favorite writers, Andre Nowen, once went up to uh, Mother Teresa, and he said, "What must I do to grow really close to the Lord?" Her answer was just classic. She said, every day, begin your day by spending one hour alone with the Lord. And then the rest of your day, don't do anything that you know is wrong. 
say that it's really <laughs> That's such a nun thing to say, too. But it's so accurate. Yeah. Can I read you a poem? Sure. Uh, four lines that gets us towards service. Yeah. And then I want to talk about a movie about Mother Teresa. All right, good. That sort of gets us into service. But here's here are the words of Mother Teresa. At the heart of silence is prayer. At the heart of prayer is faith. At the heart of faith is life. And at the heart of life is service. Is service. Well, that's hard to program today. And yes, it is. <laughs> just, we'll just flash pictures of Mother, <laughs> Mother Teresa on you. There was a movie called Letters. All right. You, and you need to see it, and you need to see it. The movie about uh, Letters is about Mother Teresa. Yeah. And it's the story of, of when the Catholic Church, or shortly after she died, when the Catholic Church was deciding whether they should canonize her. Mm -hmm. And for those of you that do not have a Catholic bent, look it up. Um, Canonizing is to actually make a saint, but we won't get into the theology of that. And so as they're deciding whether to canonize her or not, um, it's coming out in her letters or in her journals that there is a dark side to Mother Teresa. And she, in her letters, in her journals, she's writing even prayers to the Lord. Why aren't you answering my prayers? Why can't I find you? You. Why? Why are you so silent? Um, sounds sort of like the psalmist, actually. Mm. Uh, but people were sort of freaking out because, wait a minute, we're thinking about canonizing this woman, and she's having doubts, and she's having darkness. One line she said was so awesome. She says to her, "Because God doesn't answer all of our prayers, and when she's living among the the poorest of the poor in India, that's hard." <laughs> and one of her entries said, "Lord." You would have more friends if you treated the friends you have a little bit better. <laughs> I love the honesty of that. <laughs> There's a lot of honesty in that. Yes. Yeah. And so so that's Mother Teresa, um, who um, was spending solitude alone with God and wrestling with God. That's part of what solitude is. And then she was in a fellowship of like-minded uh, people that loved the poor, and then she served them. She served them and she served them till the day she died. Service is a huge part of not only her condition of her soul, but ours as well. Service. So she went directly into service in her life, never ceased. Um, she could have stopped. Mm-hmm. I've done enough, you know, all that. But she didn't because she, that's the ful- fulfillment that she got. She got uh, I shouldn't say this word, but she got jazzed up by it. She, she was yep. she was living her life for that. And even in doubt, she continued to do it because she knew in the long run, altogether, that's what she was supposed to do. Indeed. And there was a great satisfaction. There's a joy, even in the hardest times, knowing you're serving the Lord. Yes, there really is. And to know that life is about the other. That to me is what, what solitude begins because God is the other, what fellowship develops because now you are the other. And then service really looks at the needy. They are the other. In, in some ways, when I hear God's voice in, in solitude and I experience God's presence in fellowship, now I sense God's affirmation in serving. God is using me. God is affirming me as I serve other people. That was Mother Teresa. That was Jesus too, with the passage in Luke 6, and they were touching him and they were being with him. And that's what service is all about, being with people who need you. Um, you said solitude. His, your writing is as bad as mine. Uh, <laughs> my, um, my dad was a surgeon. Oh, <laughs> I came by it honestly. Solitude includes humility and honor. Indeed. And fellowship, grace and joy. So service is presence and presence. Yeah, it's sort of a pun, but I mean it on purpose. Solitude includes presence. You cannot serve people without being with them. Okay. Um, as we record this, the Ukraine and Russian battle is still fighting. Boy, that's it's, and it's not getting any better. I just read heard something for Al Jazeera, of all places, I was reading it. Chemical <laughs> plants now? Uh, Blowing up uh, children's hospitals. Yeah. So a Ukrainian pastor, I know we were talking about him. Um, 
a few weeks before the battle started, the invasion, I should say, that started, his friends were saying, why don't you come to the United States? Uh, you and your wife, you can come and live with us until that sort of boils over. He said, no, 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 no. I need to be with my people. Mm. And so he's still there now. That's service. It's being with you. I can't serve you by just saying, Mark, just go be warm and filled and I'll pray for you. You know, it's more than prayer. Mm. It's prayer is huge, but it's also let me help you. You know, my father was a, was a well-known surgeon in his community. Uh, and most of his life, he was not a Christ follower. And every now and then there would be other colleagues of his that would, that I would learn were following Christ. And I thought, great, maybe Dr. I'll make the name up. Dr. Josephson is going to have an impact on my dad. Well, so this torn, this tornado rips through our community where my dad lived and a number of people were dead and a number of people were injured. They came to his hospital and my dad, my unchurched dad came up with this idea. Let's we as the physicians of the community, let's contribute. I think he said $5,000 each. Let's contribute to the needs of the people in our community. And so who did he go to first? He went to the one that he knew was a Christ follower. And he went to Dr. Josephson. Again, wow. made up the name. So you know what Dr. Josephson said? What? No, I'm not going to give you $5,000, but I'm going to pray for them. Oh. If my dad was at a negative two toward conversion, conversion being zero, those words turned him into a negative five mm. because he wasn't willing to put his money where his mouth was. Service is putting our money where our mouth is. What did James say? Um, I, I will show you my faith by my works. Yeah. I need to have faith. And then that needs to be followed up by works. If I'm going to authenticate my Christianity and I'm going to do any good in the world in which I live, that's service and service is presence. I am present with you. Who's in need. Sometimes you don't even need to say anything. Go visit that person in the hospital and stop talking. Just be present. That's what, that's what serving is all about. It's presence. Um, my favorite book in the Bible is James. And I read years ago that when they were putting together the Bible at, at what, uh, the year 320 or whatever it was, they were very reluctant to put in the book of James mm -hmm. because they thought it crossed the line into works, a yep. works mentality. Some churches today have that before anything else almost. Mm -hmm. When you are a, a Christ follower, you you do that because you love him and he loves you. Yes. You do it as a as a... I don't know how to put it. You just can't help but be compelled to help those in his name. Yeah. It just happens. A lot of times we Christians use the word joy. And a lot of people that aren't Christians think joy is, you know, laughing out loud and having a good time and everything's wonderful. No, that's not the way it is. It's a sense of, well, you, you better explain it. <laughs> well, joy is a, is a settled contentment in life that you've been given. So you can be the, you can be Job, although he didn't until the, toward the end. You can be in the midst of suffering and experience joy. Um, joy comes through fellowship. Yeah. Discipline number two. Joy is that settled contentment. It's not laughter, although it can include laughter. It's the settled contentment that I am in the will of God and the shepherd is in control of my life. That's joy. A word that I would take right alongside joy would be the word shalom. Mm. which is wholeness. It's peace. And in a sense, that's why we do our good works. The world is anything but shalom. It's broken. It's, it's lacking its wholeness. But Christ came to restore, bring shalom to all that's broken. And in a sense, it starts with your soul. It starts when you have a relationship with Christ. The shalom is meant to be back, the peace of Christ in you. And then you shouldn't be able to help yourself, but then to spread that shalom, to spread that re restoring uh, grace wherever you go, including in service to people that really need it. That's a weird thing, but it's true. When you are in a relationship with Jesus and the, and the more you get into that relationship, you want to do things for him, which means for his people, for those he loves, non-believers, believers, everybody. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter that if you are 
a believer in him, you're going to follow where he wants Indeed. you to go. It's a wonderful, wonderful feeling. And w- where he often went was in the in the midst of the presence of people that needed him in significant ways. Let me take you to the other word. So presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E. Now presence Being with there. a T. That's stuff. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you do need to give the $5,000. You need to give the presence, the things that are needed. As you know, I do a a lot of work with India with an organization called the Dignity Freedom Network. And the Dignity Freedom Network gives not only their presence in the community of those that are in the bottom of the caste system who just need the dignity of the Lord, but they more than just giving them a word of dignity. It's, it's about planting churches, building hospitals, building schools, building women's centers, because they are there present giving presents. This is what you need. You need a hospital. Here's a hospital. You need a school for your children. Here's a school. So a lot of my work, some of it's leadership training and teaching, but a lot of what we do is we raise money to give presents because that's what they need. Um, can I say one other thing, sure, too? Sure. Service is so important for your soul spiritually. And you will find, you even reflect in your own life, some of your most spiritually high moments, mm-hmm. if you've been involved in service, is in serving other people. Mm-hmm. I can remember the time, this was many years ago now, where we were... Um, our church was helping rebuild homes or from scratch, mm. build homes after Hurricane Katrina. Okay. And I can still remember when I was down in the New Orleans area, actually praying for and giving the keys of the front door to a lady who <laughs> Katrina completely wiped her house away. And in, in a matter of time, we re- rebuilt her a new house. And I'll never forget the tears of that lady, the the gratitude attitude of that lady and to just be able to stand sort of in the place of the Lord and say, this is a gift from God for you. I'll never forget that. I can't believe you'd say that because that is probably my favorite time and serving. I got together with a bunch of people. I didn't know they were believers. I had no clue. And we were going to help fix up this house, really bad shape house in our, in Akron. And I went there and I was uncomfortable because I, I never did that kind of thing. I was oh, okay. And I went there thinking, well, I don't know how to use a hammer that well or anything like that. But I get there and before we started, this woman led us all in prayer. I had no idea this. And the joy yes. that I felt knowing these people were serving him in the most wonderful. And that, that was beautiful. It really was. And that's the answer to how is your soul? Your soul becomes fully alive when you are serving other people, whether it's at a soup kitchen or the babies in your church or what you just described in serving. Now, again, it's got to be in that order. So you cannot just be serving people. It's got to start with solitude an alone time with the Lord. And then it's the fellowship of other believers and then it's the serving. And that, to me, those are the disciplines that make for a really healthy soul, alone with the Lord, and you're, he's speaking to your, to your heart. Together with other people, he's in the midst of your fellowship, where two or more are gathered. And then um, being used by God and affirming, uh, his affirming you and your gifts as you serve other people, and you really touch where they are and what they need most. Sometimes purely in physical ways. And in reality, you can't do things until you've gone in that order. You start with solitude. You get deeply uh, involved with him. You pray, you read, you do everything you can to get him to know him better. Mm -hmm. And then you share it with other people. And you have this, it helps to build your faith and you understand the different needs of different people. Then after that, you're motivated to want to go out there and do something for him, which You know, there's a kind of a selfish thing about being a Christian. And this is funny. One of the things that's most important about being a Christian is not being selfish, learning not to be selfish. But in a way, you're being selfish. Because if you become a believer in Jesus Christ, you're getting something out of it that never could happen with anything Mm -hmm. else. So in a way, you're kind of going, I'll do this because it'll make me feel better. Now, of course, that's not true. But... There yes. is this almost God's God's saying it's okay to feel that way. There's joy, there's fulfillment, and all that. There is a dear lady um, who means so much to me. Uh, some time ago, I said something up front um, in church about. I would really love to start a support ministry for, for our community of cancer 
uh, oh, wow. cancer patients, okay. either the survivors of cancer or family of, of those who have cancer. And I was wondering, would anybody step up? This young, this dear uh, lady from our church, she is in the in the midst of cancer herself, going through chemotherapy, loves Christ. She said, I want to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. And so she is. She's heading up a ministry for those that are going through cancer, serving others because she's experiencing it herself. That's joy. Is she healed? No. Does she have joy? You bet, because she's serving. And th that's what God does to us. God changes our hearts. God gives us spiritual gifts. And especially as Americans, God gives us so many resources to help other people. And it's when we use those resources, it could be building a home for Habitat P for Humanity. It could be teaching kids in your church. It, it could be give, writing a big fat check. But it's those kind of things to that touch other people that Christ gave us a example, that's how we serve. And when we serve, it'll be good for our souls. Well, that's it. Next week, we're going to, we're going to do the, uh, the old look at the 10 commandments. We are. I love, there's an old movie with Mel Brooks and he's coming off the <laughs> mountain and he has three tablets in his, in his hands. And he says, I give you fit. And one of them falls. He goes, Ten commandments. <laughs> They're extremely important commandments. Yes. I, I think we'll have a good time discussing them, um, not just historically and theologically, but their rel relevance for today. All right. I really enjoy you being there for us. I hope you've learned something and enjoyed it as well. I hope your soul's okay. Until next time, I'm Mark Pennell with Paul Sartorelli.